the uh, first words I spoke in the original phonograph. A little piece of practical poetry. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Thank you, Mr. Edison. Welcome to Matinees on Main Street. My name is Alan. This is a podcast about the movies. We are now up to the fourth episode, which is the story of America's greatest inventor, Thomas Edison. And this is the story of the phonograph, by way of the telegraph and the telephone. Maybe you're thinking, why are we discussing the phonograph when this is a podcast about the history of the movies? Well, primarily that's because of the choices Edison made during that time. Some of the decisions Edison made about the phonograph were repeated when Edison started the development of the moving pictures, and some of those decisions weren't good. Edison's influence upon the early decades of the movies was immense. It was his decisions that directed the growth of the industry and his mistakes that allowed it to expand in the way it did. Those decisions and mistakes were harbingers of the future and are primarily the result of Edison's mindset. Some of those decisions he made were not beneficial to the success of the phonograph, and when he repeated them, they didn't help the movies either. Instead, he placed some groundbreaking instruments into a cultural box known as novelties, and he ignored both their importance and their relevance to our modern culture. Edison also gives us a view of the world of invention and patent application. That's a world much more ruthless than we tend to believe. Many of our most important inventions faced all sorts of legal hurdles and illegal incidents. To be truthful, we have to look at this world with a clear eye. Much of what the people know about Edison comes more from common rumors of the day than from his life. We know those stories better than we know the facts. For example, Edison seems to have encouraged a belief in the myth of the lone inventor. The lone inventor is a man who works in his basement or garage and struggles against all odds to develop a machine that will change the world. But many of the great inventors were not lone wolves, and that includes Edison. None of these inventors created their machine through sheer genius alone. They worked within a world of scientific knowledge, competition, and ambitious financiers. They published their research in trade journals, researched competitors' works, and tried to market their inventions. And every once in a while, they sued each other for patent infringement. In the mid-19th century, America was still growing from its roots along the East Coast. We were way behind Europe in various fields of scientific research. America lacked schools of higher learning, especially places that taught advanced science. Our country had more of a need for people who worked basic labor than it did for specialized learning. Instead, independent men who had mechanical talent invented machines that helped with our labor shortage. Those machines changed the way we handled our agriculture and industry. They also gave America a reputation for being gifted in the applied sciences. But much of the knowledge that these self-taught men used when developing their machines came from Europe. If America was a place where a talented mechanic could create an invention, Europe was the place to discover scientific thought. Like I mentioned about Etienne Jules Murray in the last episode, European scientists wrote papers about their scientific findings and published them in trade journals that were mailed around the world. Eventually, these papers would be compiled into books. Inventors such as Edison, Henry Ford, and the Wright brothers all used these books and journals to help them understand any problems that they faced when they invented these machines. They searched bookstores and libraries to find the helpful information they needed in whatever field they were studying. Another example of life within the world of invention was the business and management side of Edison's career. At the beginning, he worked within the structure of a large communications company. After that, he established himself as the manager of his own laboratory facility. In fact, at one point, he ran three of them. The first laboratory employed at least 70 people, while the largest lab may have employed well over 150 workers at one time. The cost of maintaining these labs came from his financial backers, as well as the work Edison and his employees did for many of his customers and clients. 
Because he had earned such a good reputation as a mechanical inventor, he had a backlog of projects and could spend as much as 18 hours a day in the lab. Some of these ideas succeeded. Others failed. At times, the failures led to other things, and if he was lucky, those other things could pay off. The phonograph was one of these. Its development didn't come out of thin air, but through the channels of other people's important inventions, such as Samuel Morris's telegraph and Alexander Graham Bell's telephone. When Edison was working on these projects, he assigned them to various employees. He also helped research their projects, passing along suggestions and ideas for them to do in an attempt to open up whatever dead ends he or his assistants were facing. Edison also spent a lot of time at the workbench and could get very dirty. That's how he looked when he met his first wife. The people who worked for him understood that the company and not the individual inventor got the credit for whatever was achieved. This process still holds true today, whether a person works in the pharmaceutical industry, the automobile industry, or the computer industry. As Edison owned his research lab and as he was the man whose name was on the company, Credit fell to him. Still, Edison did intentionally blur this line on occasion. He disliked fame, but loved how his PR and celebrity could enhance his reputation. He could have corrected all those mistaken facts if he had wanted to, but he preferred to let the public believe what it wanted to believe. Young Tom Edison was born in Ohio in 1847. Because of the growing rivalry between the canal building industry and the up-and-coming railroad industry, the family's hometown suffered and the Edisons abandoned their failing business. They moved to Port Huron, a town in Michigan that was serviced by the railroad. Edison was what we would call homeschooled. His mother taught him writing, arithmetic, geography, and other basics, but his great interest was science. During his childhood, Tom started selling concessions on the train route offering newspapers, tobacco, and fruit. His business was successful enough that he expanded it into other trains and hired a few boys to handle the excess business. During this time, he continued to read science books as well as experiment in chemistry. It was also around this time that he lost a significant amount of his hearing. During his adolescence, he rescued a young boy who was playing on the railroad tracks while a train was approaching. The boy's father worked as a telegrapher and rewarded Edison by teaching him telegraphy. Over the next several years, Edison worked as a telegrapher, meaning he sent telegraphs and received them, usually taking the night shift as the slower communications traffic of the nighttime allowed him to work on his scientific experiments. The job also encouraged his interest in electricity, which allowed him to apply whatever electrical theories he learned. After the Civil War, he settled in Louisville, Kentucky. Unfortunately, he lost his job as a telegrapher after one of his science experiments started a fire. Desperate for work, he wired a friend out east and became a telegrapher in Boston. It was in Boston that Edison started his professional career as an inventor. While he continued to work as a telegrapher, he also experimented with chemistry and mechanics at an industrial machine shop where its owner, Charles Williams, rented out space to inventors. There, he started investigating ways to improve the telegraph. Among the ideas he pursued was an election ticker for state legislatures. He also investigated further improvements on the telegraph, such as increasing the number of messages that could be carried on one line. He wasn't the only one at that time that was working on improving the telegraph. Joseph B. Stearns also worked at the rental lab and was developing a telegraph that could send a fire alarm while routine messages continued to be transmitted. Boston proved to be a struggle for Edison. It was difficult for him to find investors to support his projects, and his job didn't pay well. For starters, his election ticker proved to be a bust. This fiasco forced him to proclaim that, from now on, he would only work on ideas that had guaranteed profitability. This promise would prove to have a big impact on the way Edison treated both the phonograph and the movie-making process. 
His time in Boston ended when he attempted to test the duplex telegraph he had devised. It was a system that would send two messages at the same time. Its concept was derived from the Stern's fire alarm telegraph, although the design was unique enough to avoid a lawsuit from Western Union, the owners of the Stern's patent. While Edison seems to have developed a working duplex, when he made arrangements to test it in a distant city, the system didn't work. This was due either to a bad design or a careless telegraph operator. Regardless, the demonstration proved to be a fiasco and Edison found it easier just to move to Manhattan. In New York City, everything that Edison wanted came together. What proved to be his godsend was the telegraph system for the Gold Indicator Company. The system was a network of telegraphs that transmitted the price of gold between the Laws Gold and Stock Reporting Company, which was based in New York City, and a number of gold investment firms in the area. A few broken pieces inside the transmitting telegraph had jammed the telegraph system. Edison did contract work there and watched as his supervisor and the company's management panicked over the situation. Edison was able to analyze the problem, fix it, and have the area telegraphs recalibrated within two hours. His efforts saved laws from imminent disaster. The company was greatly pleased and Edison was hired as a full-time employee. Within a month, laws sold out and Edison was again without a job. He formed a partnership with another inventor, and they soon had clients, such as his former employer, the New Gold and Stock Company, as well as the mighty Western Union Company. Western Union would soon buy out Edison's patents for $40,000, and with Gold and Stock also providing support, Edison used the money to set up a lab in Newark, New Jersey. Edison hired assistants and produced upgrades and variations on the Western Union telegraphy system. Among these improvements was one that could type words out instead of the Morse code, as well as an automated system that replaced manual functions with automated functions, improvements on coatings of the electrical wires, and a telegraph that could display its messages upon a mirror. On the whole, the telegraph was making Edison quite successful, although most of his money was turned back into his business. Telegraphy had become such a part of his life that he nicknamed his first two children Dot and Dash. In 1875, Edison was able to move from the building he rented in Newark to his own building in Menlo Park, New Jersey. It was built to his specifications. Along with a main lab, five other buildings stood, including a carpenter's shop and a blacksmith shop. During this time, he continued to improve the telegraph, and at the same time, a new invention arrived on the scene, Alexander Graham Bell's telephone. Just to let you know, it's at this point that the story gets dangerously complicated and much of it doesn't apply to the phonograph. At the same time, some of it does apply. So rather than tell the whole sordid tale of the development of the telephone, I'll try to separate the wheat from the shaft. It's fair to say that while the official story is that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, there is a lot of independent study as well as a lot of stray documentation suggesting that he didn't invent it. Or at the very least, it's a tangled mess of accusations, finger-pointing, and legal shenanigans. As for our story, it's easiest just to know that a number of people were pursuing the idea and that the only company at that time with any real interest in telecommunications was Western Union. And that company was not interested in developing the telephone. The first person to probably develop a telephone was an Italian inventor living on Staten Island. This was around 1850, and his name was Antonio Mucci. The telephone he invented was used within his house, but he did give a few public demonstrations of his phone in the late 1850s. At the time, he didn't have the $250 needed to apply for a patent. On the other hand, 
A few years later, he would have the money to patent a process that made varnish and paint out of crude oil. Apparently, Mucci was just one of several people who could not see the opportunities the telephone suggested. At the end of 1871, Mucci, along with a few Italian-American businessmen, attempted to set up a telephone company in New York City. Mucci filed for a patent caveat, which is a notification of intent that you plan to develop a certain idea. It also warns off other investors from using the same design. In 1872, he attempted to test his phones on the transmission wires of the American District Telegraph Company. In 1874, he failed to renew his caveat, thereby giving others the opportunity to study what he had developed and to pursue the inventing of the telephone. In 2002, the U.S. Congress acknowledged that Mucci was a pioneering developer of the telephone. Now, how much did others know about Mucci's work? For starters, Mucci's inventiveness seems to have been across the board, as he created a number of inventions and devised a number of formulations in different fields of science. His inventions and patents were occasionally reported in local and regional newspapers, and considering that his patent caveat also contained a schematic of what he did, it's hard not to believe that other inventors were not aware of what he was doing. By 1875, Western Union was still not interested in the telephone, even if the invention proved capable of using Western Union's telegraph lines. That disinterest included any telephonic ideas or projects being developed by Alexander Graham Bell or, more importantly, Elijah Gray. So who was Elijah Gray? Gray was probably America's best regarded inventor at that time. Like Edison, he had provided a number of patent changes and inventions to Western Union. When Western Union bought out Gray's patents, he was able to establish his own development company, which was the Chicago-based Western Electric Company. While both Gray and Edison were now independent inventors, Edison would continue to direct his interests towards Western Union's viewpoint, while Gray started working on other ideas that involved electric motors. What connected Edison and Gray to the telephone was the quadruplex, the latest telegraphic concept that Western Union did want to pursue. Edison would eventually develop the quadruplex in 1874, but in the early 1870s, the field was more open to independent inventors. A quadruplex was simply a telegraph that could send four messages along one line. It was at this time that Alexander Graham Bell started exploring the same area. Both Gray and Bell stopped investigating the quadruplex once Edison developed it. In the process, both men had discovered that varying resistance produced tones that varied in pitch, and that could also be used to send multiple messages. Both men were also aware how close this idea was to just sending sound over the wires. The solution to that would be to attach a diaphragm to a variable resistor that both had been using. This was the difference that made the telephone. Mucci seems to have accomplished this back in the 1850s, and with his patent caveat now expired, the idea was open to plunder. This story now quickly descends into its black heart. Did Gray or Bell steal ideas from Mucci? Did Bell steal from Gray, as some people insist? Or maybe steal is too strong a word, as these ideas were now open to others. Did Bell come up with these ideas on his own, or did his father-in-law uncover them for him? There are quite a number of books that dissect this issue, but the only thing that is of real concern to this story is the diaphragm variable resistor. As Western Union was interested in this mechanical device, because of its link to transferring sound through the quadruplex, it would soon be passed on to Edison to be improved upon. I have to deviate here for a few minutes because of another small thing that the black heart of the telephone story gives to the story of the phonograph, and that is Bell's investors. Now would be a good time to talk about investors. While there are many people with inventive ideas who also have the ability to make these ideas a reality, 
the difference between creating an important invention and revolutionizing the world with it is simply the money that is backing you up. That money must protect you while you give up your job in order to spend months, if not years, standing at a workbench, reading scientific journals, buying supplies, and investigating all the dead ends that you run into. All of this will happen to you before you have an invention that works. After your idea is invented, someone has to pay the expensive fees for filing patents, as well as other fees and costs to investigate whether your patent conflicts with someone else's. After those hurdles, you have to make and promote your invention. The inventions that best succeed are the ones that can convince a number of wealthy people that they can make a lot of money out of your creation, and better yet, control an industry. This is a very important piece of knowledge to consider when you wonder why some of the people succeeded in this game of creating telephones and movie projectors, while so many others failed. Elisha Gray succeeded in telegraphy, but he would eventually fail in the telephone because others were quicker with the money, despite Western Union's backing. And Antonio Mucci had even less money behind him, while Thomas Edison would succeed beyond anyone's wildest dreams. And part of that was due to his connections to Bell's investors. Now, Alexander Graham Bell was from Scotland, where his father, Alexander Melville Bell, ran a school for the deaf. This school gave them an education and taught them to communicate. The Bells eventually moved to London, where Alec received an education, but with the death of his brothers due to tuberculosis, the family moved back to Scotland. As the deaths continued, the family moved to Canada, where Alexander Melville started a new school for the deaf. At some point, Alec Jr. became close to the members of the Mohawk Nation and learned to communicate with them through sign language. He took this skill back to the school and developed a sign language for the deaf. This innovation brought his father's school to the attention of other deaf schools in New England, and for a time the family settled in Boston. It would be in Boston where Bell would do his inventing. In the early 1870s, Bell dropped his teaching job in order to work on the quadruplex full-time. He continued teaching two students as a way to provide his support, George Sanders and Mabel Hubbard. Sanders was only seven at the time, and Mabel was a young adolescent. The Sanders had made their money through leather processing, production, and sales. While Bell worked on his communications invention, the Sanders housed him. The Hubbards were even better off. Gardner Hubbard was, very conveniently, a patent lawyer. He was also the driving legal force behind the congressional attempt to break up Western Union. That bill was known as the Hubbard Bill. When Bell, who was in his mid-twenties, fell in love with Mabel, her father was more disturbed about Bell's lack of focus towards his invention than he was about the ten-year difference between this school teacher and his deaf teenage daughter. At the time, both Bell and Gray were under the gun to complete their version of the quadruplex telegraph although that became a moot point after March of 1875. That's when Edison patented his quadruplex. From there on, Gray and Bell both focused on the harmonic telegraph, at least until both men suddenly shifted to what we think of as the telephone. Both Bell and Gray wanted credit for the telephone, but it was really only Bell and his financiers who developed the telephone's potential. Everyone else involved with the invention of the telephone saw it as a novelty, at least until the threesome started to make money. Even Gray was much more concerned about his musical telegraph than he was about a voice communications machine. Bell, Hubbard, and Sanders formed Bell Telephone, and while the majority of the stock was split between the three men, Bell gave almost all of his stock to Mabel when they married two days after incorporation. At the start, Bell Company made its money renting out their phones instead of selling them. But it expanded aggressively, and like the later phonograph parlors and Nickelodeons, 
investors were eager to start up Bell Rental Centers across America and even Europe. As for Western Union, they didn't concern themselves with any of this until they saw how aggressively Bell Telephone had expanded. Finally, in 1877, Western Union was suddenly taken by the idea of the telephone. The company had been sitting on Gray's patents, and now they wanted to do something with it. There were also rumors that they were holding Mucci's telephone, but that doesn't seem likely. The supposed reason for Western Union's change of heart was that the communications traffic on the quadruplex was so heavy that it made conversations between management and their field telegraphers nearly impossible. It was suggested that an internal telephone system would solve the problem. Unfortunately, Western Union wasn't happy with Gray's variable resistor and asked Edison to improve it. What he came up with was a transmitter that used a carbon button rather than moistened paper. Unfortunately, Emil Berliner, a German-American, also claimed to have developed the same thing. Berliner would fight Edison's patent in court and lose. Like the investors, Berliner is another name that will be later involved in the phonograph story, as he's the man who developed the flat record. On a whim, Edison inserted a needle into his carbon transmitter and dragged it across a piece of waxed parchment. He did this while talking into the transmitter. To Edison, it was a lark, but he was able to hear himself repeat the alphabet when he dragged the needle back over the groove. The next things that happened proved to be quite prophetic for the movies. Edison's cute little trick with the transmitter and needle was done sometime in July of 1877. To him, it was a novelty that humored him, but Edison didn't take novelty seriously. During that summer, Edison had experienced his first taste of celebrity. His duplex machine was at the center of a lawsuit between Western Union and renegade financier Jay Gould. Due to the trial's publicity, Edison's name suddenly appeared in the press, and the first articles about his life and talents were humoring his ego. This was the kind of celebrity he enjoyed. At some time between July and October of that year, Edison sketched out an idea for a machine that would be able to do what that transmitter and parchment paper did. He kept the needle idea and had its sound amplified by a diaphragm and horn. Instead of wax paper, he had tin foil wrapped around a cylinder. The cylinder was cranked while the needle was set in place in order to carve an acoustic groove into the tin foil. When the cylinder was cranked, the needle started scratching its groove. Tom Edison spoke into the machine. There have been discussions in the scientific community about recording the human voice in much the same way that photographs could record the human face. The most prominent name connected with the idea was a Frenchman, Charles Cross. He had designed a machine but had not yet constructed it. That had led some people to believe that it wasn't possible. Edison said publicly that he had accomplished this, with the usual chorus of doubters chiming in. So Edison appeared at the office of Scientific American Magazine and produced his machine for the front office to see. Cranking the handle, they heard his voice rising out of the phonograph's megaphone. The science publishers were stunned and amazed. Now, a number of Edison books believe that this happened in early December of 1877, but a number of newspapers from the first week of November highlight the scientific American surprise. The Cincinnati Daily Star called it a wonderful invention. The New York Sun stated that nothing could be more incredible than the likelihood of once more hearing the voice of the dead. Through the end of the year, the newspapers printed ink on Edison and his marvelous new toy. These stories appeared just as the articles about the Western Union Jay Gould trial were winding down. America and Europe had become amazed by the news of the phonograph. With the advent of the new year, Edison found himself a celebrity and one who was finding his precious work time being stolen by celebrity seekers. 
in particular the crowds that started showing up at his Menlo Park laboratory so that they could take tours and talk with a nearly deaf celebrity who had captured sound. Edison was already frustrated by this sudden attention, but at the same time he sent one of his associates, Edward Johnson, on a lecture tour that spotlighted the phonograph as it recorded and played to astonished audiences. These lectures and performances further inflated Edison's sudden celebrity. Over the year, Edison continued to humor the press, but grew more frustrated with those who interfered with his work time. Even his investors considered the possibility of marketing the phonograph, but he ignored their idea. Soon, Edison was pursuing another idea that a number of inventors had discussed but had failed to build, the light bulb. With this, Edison took a shift towards urban electrification. Through much of the first half of the 1880s, he immersed himself in an attempt to electrify the city of New York using neighborhood substations that provided direct current power. At the same time, George Westinghouse and Nikola Tesla were promoting a different form of electrical power, alternating current. Edison considered AC too dangerous to use, but Tesla found ways to step down the power. Between the current war and the many problems he faced in electrifying a New York neighborhood, Edison's work was proving to be frustrating at best. Now, looking back on this part of the story, you can see that Edison enjoyed playing around with the recording of sound when it was in the discovery stage. He also seemed to like the idea of designing a machine and giving it to someone else in the lab to build. By the way, that's a common practice in lab work. He also liked the attention he received from the press concerning his discovery. But once celebrity caused the disruption of his daily work schedule, with a number of people arriving to see the facility and talk to him, he found it quite frustrating. Edison was actually a patient man when it came to inventing. He was so patient that he was willing to work day and night on projects. It was his joy, his reason for living. But his focus was on projects that seemed important at the time. The telegraph was important as it contributed to mass communication. As he saw it, the phonograph was a machine whose production would need a lot of capital. It would require a manufacturing facility, but its life expectancy was assumed to be really short. The act of lighting cities was important because it broke up the gas monopoly. Gas was the civic utility that charged high prices for people to illuminate their houses and businesses. Edison thought that the creation of an electric utility would give the public lower prices. He never foresaw that the electric companies would become just as disliked in the 20th century as the gas utilities were in the 19th. Edison liked creating inventions and processes that benefited people, not entertain them. When he started to study a way to make moving pictures, it was just as a side project, while his main focus was an attempt to salvage the East Coast's mining industry. Even William Dixon, the man who was doing the bench work on the movies, was primarily focused on the mining industry. The movies were like the phonograph. They were not important. Neither invention added to human dignity or improved the lives of people. All they did was entertain, and nothing was more trivial than entertainment. Through his lawyers, Edison did create an Edison Talking Phonograph Company. Its purpose was to promote the phonograph, primarily through Edward Johnson's lecture tours. He also hoped to use the company to sell his Western Union telephones and carbon transmitters. There were attempts to market the phonograph, but there were problems. The first was cost, as they were handmade at the time. The second was the machines had flaws, and Edison had no time to devote to the improvement of a novelty. Considering that the phonograph would soon be a musical marvel, people were quite surprised to see the machine married to popular music. As it was planned, the phonograph was to be a dictation machine could also teach the proper pronunciation of words and language. It was to be a new storage facility for family histories, not just the dates of births and deaths, but samples of the way our ancestors talked. It could be used to announce time, and it could teach. 
Looking back over our technological revolution, it's quite amazing how often we saw that same vision from televisions to computers and even to Siri. Then each one, in turn, becomes our latest form of entertainment. But we know that now. It seems as if we let technology down more than it lets us down. As we come near the end of this long story, people we once discussed, such as Gardner Hubbard, return. Since forming Bell Telephone, Hubbard became a wealthy man, and as he did with Alec Bell, he invested in Tom Edison. While he wasn't as financially powerful as were a number of other Edison investors, he was probably more interested in the commercial possibilities of the phonograph than were the others. Among the others included George Harrington, who had been a clerk in the U.S. Department of the Treasury, but was later Assistant Secretary of the Treasury under Lincoln. He was known as being the man who organized Lincoln's funeral. Then there was Daniel Craig, who started the Associated Press News Distribution Syndicate. General William Palmer was a civil engineer who rose from captain to general during the Civil War, and William P. Mellon was a New York lawyer with connections to the U.S. Treasury. All these men were financially conservative with a strong philanthropic streak in their hearts. They invested in railroads and believed in things that brought the country together. Having supported schools for the deaf, Hubbard could also be described as a philanthropist. But he was also new money. He was not a lawyer who represented companies, but a man who helped inventors claim or fight patents. He was a major backer of the Edison Speaking Phonograph Company, and he saw the money that could be made from selling these phonographs. He also knew of the machine's problems. So why not improve upon them? From Hubbard's point of view, since Edison had improved upon Bell's variable transmitter, why couldn't Bell improve on Thomas Edison's phonograph? To him it was a great idea, but it would lead to many problems. In 1880, Bell won the Volta Prize for his telephone, a $10,000 award from the French government. With that money, he set up the Volta Laboratory in Washington, D.C. It was at this time that Hubbard approached his son-in-law about fine-tuning the phonograph. After all, if Edison wasn't going to do it, why not Bell? Bell had hired his cousin, Chichester Bell, an Irish doctor and chemist, to work on the project along with Charles Tainter, a scientist and specialist in instrument making. What they accomplished was to replace the tin foil of the cylinder with a hard wax coating. They also suspended the needle rather than fixing it to the diaphragm. They soon patented the machine, called it a graphophone, and Edison was furious. Still, he only had himself to blame as he had never filed a U.S. patent on the phonograph. Back in 1877, Edison had patented the phonograph, but only in England. No one can explain why Edison didn't file for a U.S. patent. Worse, he explained in his British patent applications all the things that could be improved upon the phonograph. This was an apparent laundry list for the bells to use when they improved the machine. Edison soon filed a lawsuit to reclaim his rights as well as the profits to the graphophone, but it all went against him. This legalistic sloppiness will haunt Edison terribly when he works on moving pictures. By the mid-1880s, he was forced to compete with the Bells over the talking machine market. He created a new and improved version of his phonograph, but was still struggling to get it on the market. By 1888, a Pittsburgh glass manufacturing millionaire named Jesse Lippicott bought the rights to Edison's phonograph and would soon do the same for Bell's graphophone. Lippicott formed the North American Phonograph Company, which sold both machines, and it's through Lippicott's firm that the machine started to take the turn from dictation to music recording and playing. Finally, there is Emil Berliner. Berliner was a German who moved to America to avoid being drafted in the Franco-Prussian War. He lived in New York City and took night courses in physics at Cooper's Union. It could be said that Berliner's economic status was even lower than Mucci's, as his lab was in a stable. 
yet he was able to devise a new variable transmitter at around the same time as Edison, who came first as the debate, but Berliner lost the legal fight to Edison. Instead, Berliner was able to get one up on Edison by developing a turntable record player rather than one that used cylinders. The problem with disc players had always been that centrifugal drag pushed on the outside groove edge as the spinning record pulled the needle towards the center of the disc. Edison had been concerned enough about this problem that he chose to use a cylinder instead of the disc. But records are much easier to manufacture and store than were cylinders. In 1889, when Edison was first involved with the moving picture process, Berliner started to release his gramophone and his first recording discs in Europe. He used opera singers to give his fledgling recordings a veneer of glamour. By the middle of the 1890s, about the time that Edison was releasing his kinetoscope, Berliner was finally selling his machine and records in America. Again, a legal war developed, and Edison was forced to fight for an industry that he wanted nothing to do with, that is, until it became profitable. This, again, is a real foreshadowing of the moving picture legal wars. There are people who suspect Edison of conniving and plotting to ruin others, as well as to take over industries. He would certainly try that with the movies. But he could also be careless and a poor planner of business strategy. He was quite focused on other projects that were more egalitarian than profit-driven. When we get to the episodes concerning Edison's involvement in the development of the movies, it's important to remember that his very nature was not capitalistic, but scientific. Only when he saw others making money on things he developed did he develop a bit of a mean and stubborn streak. Unfortunately, he also proved to be not as sharp a fighter as he believed he was. He was careless with the patent process and not quite smart enough when it came to understanding the ways of people who are obsessed with money. But that's enough about Edison for now. For our next episode, we'll return to San Francisco and check in on ex-Governor Leland Stanford and Edward Mybridge. Things had changed for both men, and things were changing in the field of photography. Let's see how all these changes affected them, especially the development of dry plates and the publication of Etienne Jules Marais' book on animal motion. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.